Both Edwin Diaz and Christian Scott pitched in the minor leagues this week. Brandon Sprout is a top 50 prospect. We have a ton to cover on today's Friday Farm Report. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash lockdown MLB and use the code on lowercase lockdown MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Now, I am finally back home in the Locked On Mets studios here. It was great being out in DC watching Mets versus Nationals, but there's something better about being on camera for the YouTube audience in my typical setup and not recording in a garage under the hotel. So I'm happy to be back, and I will be previewing the London series that's coming up. Uh, I'm going to do that on tomorrow's show, though, because there's so much to talk about with this Mets farm system, and with the off days, it is the perfect time to really dive in. I want to start with Christian Scott. Still technically a prospect, has yet to officially graduate, so he's still ranked on top prospect list. I'm going to talk about that in the next segment a little bit, but He made a start this week in Syracuse, and I was fascinated to see what was the workload going to be because I had my theories when the Mets sent him down after his start on May 30th. I believed they were going to really taper off his workload, and they did, but not to the extent I was expecting. He still pitched five innings. He was probably on a 60-pitch limit. I would imagine something like that because he ends up at exactly 59 pitches. 40 of them were strikes. He walked one. He struck out seven he gave up a solo home run to the first batter he faced, which was Edouard Julian, uh, who was a guy that had a great season last year with the Twins in the big leagues. And then from that point on, he only gave up one more hit, and it was an infield hit. So Christian Scott, dominant in AAA. Having him pitch at this level is wasting bullets. It just is. But it made sense. You did not need a six-man rotation, and your bullpen needed help. The move for Christian Scott to go down added Danielle Nunez to the bullpen who in my opinion is the best reliever they have right now, all of a sudden. So it's a very tricky balance the Mets are going to have to play here with trying to get Scott up, but needing to have him on a six-man rotation when he is up. And then also what that does to your bullpen, having to carry one less guy. So it really is complicated. I looked at the Mets schedule. And for those of you who aren't aware of what they have ahead of them this month, you have the London series, which is two days off before it. And a day off after it, because obviously it's heavy travel. You return home for a six-game homestand, Marlins Padres. You go to Texas to play the Rangers. You have an off day. You play three games in Chicago against the Cubs. You have another off day. Two games set versus the Yankees. Subway Series played at City Field. And then you have an off day on that Thursday. So when you look at after the London Series, across a three-week stretch, There's four more off days. So that is why the Mets didn't really need a six-man rotation. But at the same time, because of that, I thought they might really take their time on Christian Scott and let him get a break. So what I mean by that is I thought they might skip a start. Well, he pitched on the 30th. This was right in line with him to pitch every six days, five days rest. So if that's the case, when does he pitch again? He would be due to pitch on the 11th, the first day the Mets are back from London. Problem, he's not eligible to return at that time. Won't be eligible to pitch back in the big leagues until Saturday, July 15th. Now, if they want to, they could have him throw uh, some sides and, and just wait, and then he could make his return on July 15th against the Padres. That would be the fifth game back after the London series. So you could just go right back to a six-man rotation. But again, if you did that, you're going to have a bunch of off days where, again, you don't need that starter. So how do the Mets sort of navigate that? If they wanted to, they could pitch. Let's just say Tyler McGill is going to pitch that first game back after the London series, right? And I don't know how it fares. Maybe he pitches okay. Regardless, he still has an option. 
So they could option McGill down after that, have an extra reliever for the rest of that week, and then they could on the 15th or even let's just say Scott does make his start on the 11th, right? And then you have him, and maybe it's even tampered off a little less so he can pitch on five days. Whatever it is, whether it's McGill or Peterson, you could do that where you could have them make a start coming off the London series, option them, and then insert Christian Scott into a five-man rotation with enough off days to keep him on six days rest for a couple of weeks, or excuse me, five days rest, pitching every sixth day for a couple of weeks until the Mets get into a really grueling stretch they're going to have before the All-Star break where they will play 17 games in 17 days, and that starts on June 28th. So it's really tough to decide what the Mets are going to do here because if they instead just look at this upcoming stretch and say there's too many off days, we don't want to option McGill or Peterson down, we don't want to DFA Jose Quintana, which is another option they have, well, they can just keep Christian Scott in the minor leagues, but then all of a sudden, if he's staying on a regular schedule so he can be reinserted back into a big league rotation, well, how many starts is he going to make in AAA? Because watching him make a AAA start where he's on a 60, you know, 60 pitch limit, five innings, and he goes through five innings and just carves, what does that do for him? What does that do for your team? If you still believe you have a shot this year, you sort of want this guy to be in the fold helping you make that push. If they wait until that 17-game, 17 17-day 17 stretch, Christian Scott could make four more starts in AAA or four starts altogether in AAA, including the one that he just made. He might have 20 wasted innings in AAA when he doesn't have to. Now, what does sort of line up for me is they did say when they optioned him that it was going to be a short stint down. So that would maybe indicate that they're planning on bringing him back. It was just not being part of this London series. Here's the question, though. How do you manage the bullpen with six guys in the rotation? So let's look at the bullpen right now. Danny Young and Daniel Nunez are the guys that have the options that can be up and down. But they've pitched really well. What are you going to do there? You have Reed Garrett. You have Drew Smith. Sean Reed Foley. Adam Adovino. None of those guys you'd really expect to be optioned. Adrian Hauser has pitched well as a reliever. Now, Reed Garrett, if he was to struggle a little bit, maybe he is an option candidate. You could actually throw him into that mix. He does have the ability to be optioned, but I wouldn't expect that. Would they DFA Adam Adovino because he hasn't pitched well? I doubt it. Sean Reed Foley or Drew Smith, maybe, but this is where it gets complicated because that's your bullpen that you're looking at right now, but you're also going to get Edwin Diaz back. Edwin Diaz made an appearance in Brooklyn tonight on Thursday. He picked up two strikeouts, gave up a triple, uh, scoreless inning, 14 innings pitch, or excuse me, 14 pitches in his inning. 11 of them were strikes after he was really raving about how well he felt, or he, not raving is the right word, but he was, he was very happy with how he threw the ball, said the fastball had good life, slider was sharp, just felt great after getting some treatment on his shoulder, having some time off here. And he's eligible to return on the 13th. So he's actually eligible to return before Christian Scott. And all things are lining up for him to make that return as soon as he's eligible, which is great. You'll have your closer back. I believe you need Daniel Nunez in a big league bullpen right now, but he's a guy that could, could be sent down. There's also Jake Diekman I forgot to mention as well. So if you look at the leverage guys when you get Diaz back, if it's Diaz, Garrett, Adovino, Nunez, who else is going to be part of that mix? Hauser probably still deserves a roster spot. So then you really start in Deekman. I don't think they're going to get rid of him at this juncture. So then it's Sean Reed Foley, Drew Smith, and Danny Young. And Danny Young has pitched well. Now you can DFA Sean Reed Foley and Drew Smith and go back to a six-man rotation. That might be the move. It might be Sean Reed Foley, Smith out, Diaz, and eventually Scott back in. or you can really play with the fact that you have optionality with Tyler McGill, with David Peterson, with Joey Lucchese, with Jose Budo. And you can have a five-man rotation where you're putting guys in for spot starts as well as Hauser potentially. 
when you need to, when the rest isn't there. I think they will use a six man rotation for that 17 game, 17 day stretch, but then it just makes things so much more complicated with their bullpen. So it's really a conundrum to see how they try to make all of this work, but based on merit, and this is very much feeling like a franchise that is all of a sudden a meritocracy. If it wasn't a meritocracy, you might still see Omar Narvaez on a Mets bench instead of Luis Terence, but they had an opportunity to upgrade and they went for it. You might have seen Jeff McNeil just force fed a start in that series in Washington, but it was three lefties. Jose Iglesias was playing well as a winning combination, and they stuck with it. And little teaser for tomorrow's show where I'll preview the London series. I believe we're going to see Ranger Suarez in game one, a lefty. So it could be four straight games on the pine for McNeil. Just some food for thought. How do the Mets navigate this? I don't want to see Christian Scott wasting innings in AAA, and I feel like the Mets brass doesn't either. So if he's going to come back, whether it's one more start in Syracuse or if it's some bullpens and then you have him ready to go as soon as he's eligible to rejoin the rotation against the Padres, well, there's going to be some decisions that have to be made, whether that's sending down a McGill or Peterson, designated Jose Quintana for assignment, or Optioning one of your relievers that has been pitching really well in Danny Young or Daniel Nunez, which again, one of them might have to go down for Edwin Diaz anyway. And then the other option is DFAing a reliever that doesn't have the optionality in a Sean Root Foley or a Drew Smith. Or a struggling guy like an Adafino or a Deakman, which I doubt. It's going to be really fascinating to see how the Mets play this whole thing out. But my original thought process of having them make two inning you know, appearances throughout the month of June and tapering them off so you had them later, the Mets don't seem to be interested in that. I think they're going to keep him maybe in that 60-pitch range where he can very easily be ramped right back up to a big league start. And they'll probably just ride him until they decide to shut him down at some point later in the season, which does make sense considering where they're at as a team with an uncertain you know, future as far as being able to contend deep into the season. So might as well get the MLB innings while you can. And how they do that is going to be a real, real interesting debate. So we'll, we'll watch and see what happens. Christian Scott, though, headlines just baseball's top 100 prospects when it comes to Mets. The company I work for just had an updated version of our top 100. And six prospects made the list. I want to talk about that, particularly Brandon Sprout, a new addition, and how high he climbed. We'll go through in just a minute. First, though, a word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Policy Genius. You never know what can happen in life. That is why it's always best to be prepared and make sure your family is always taken care of. This is why everyone should have life insurance, but sometimes finding the right policy is not easy and can be really time consuming and even overwhelming. This is where Policy Genius comes in. Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace that will save you time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius helps you compare quotes from the America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price and their team of licensed experts is on hand to help talk you through it. And they are not incentivized to recommend one insurer over another. So you can trust they're giving you unbiased advice every time. Check life insurance off your to-do list in no time. With Policy Genius at policygenius.com slash locked MLB or click the link in the episode description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you can save. That's policygenius.com slash locked on MLB. If you're an everyday listener of the show, make sure you become a Locked On Mets insider. This is our text and service where I give you updates anytime so the breaks on the Mets. You can ask me questions anytime. We can talk back and forth through text. You can also get the lineup graphic sent to your phone each day and take part in our Locked On Mets signed photo giveaways. If you want to be a Locked On Mets insider, find the link in the episode description. Go to subtext.com slash Locked On Mets. All right, so. JustBaseball.com is where I work, and we released our updated midseason top 100 list. We do this 
periodically throughout the season, especially when you see a lot of graduations where guys you know are playing at the big league level and they're taking off the top 100. We need to fill those spots. And Arm Layton, who is co-founder of the company, friend of mine who uh, does great work and has come on this show a bunch, he really does take his time making these decisions. He really thinks them out. He spends so much time watching video on all these guys. And it was pretty awesome to see his updated list because Brandon Sprout is a new addition. And there was a lot of new additions. I think there might have been 18, but don't quote me on that. There was a lot, though, because, again, a lot of guys graduate off. Of all the new additions, Brandon Sprout ranks the highest on this list. A lot of those guys that get added are guys that are sitting somewhere in the 101 to 120 range who just get slid onto the back end of the list. But with Brandon Sprout, he wasn't slid onto the back end of the list. He was put right smack dab in the middle. He's a top 50 prospect in baseball. Arm has Sprout at number 50. And the crazy thing is you look at where he has the other prospects in the Mets system, what this means for how Arm considers Brandon Sprout as it relates to this system, how high he has him ranked. So you look at the top 100 in its entirety. You got Christian Scott, who is now the top Mets prospect listed at number 25. Jet Williams, who hasn't played this year, sitting at 36. I can't remember exactly where he was at in our you know, preseason top 100, but I, I believe it was somewhere in that range. I don't think he moved much because he didn't play, but he didn't drop for not playing. So he's sort of in that same range. Sproat at 50. And then you have Drew Gilbert at 68, another guy who hasn't played. Luis at at 73. And then Ryan Clifford at 97. So according to Arm Layton, the top six prospects in the Mets system are Christian Scott, Jet Williams, Brandon Sprout at number three, Drew Gilbert, Luis and Helicuna, and Ryan Clifford. And how you fill out the rest of your top 10? Well, we'll have a lot of time to discuss that throughout this season. But Blade Tidwell definitely is in consideration. I think he was actually close to being a just missed here. I'm not quite sure how far away he was from making the top 100, but I know he is definitely the next closest prospect that Arm would have to cracking this type of a list. Colin Houck, we'll talk about him more in the next segment. Mets first rounder from last year. Jeremy Rodriguez, probably a guy that's in consideration to be a top 10 prospect still. You have Dom Hamill, Mike Fassel, but they haven't pitched well. So I think they're sliding further down the Mets prospect rankings. You have Giovanni Rodriguez, the huge bonus, or he signed a huge bonus, I should say, as an international free agent, the catcher the Mets signed this past offseason. So he's a guy that you know, really could be a, a big-time prospect for the Mets. We haven't seen him play just yet, so we'll wait on that. Alex Ramirez, Calvin Ziegler, Kevin Parada. Ziegler, of course, actually out for the year now, Tommy John, but a guy who really flashed when he was on the field. Jonah Tong was a top-15 prospect we had that I think probably is top-10 now. If Nolan McLean, Marco Vargas, Ron Hernandez, we'll talk about all these guys a little more, a bit more in the next segment. But the Mets have a really good farm system now. It's the bottom line through all of this. And you look at other franchises in Major League Baseball that has six top 100 guys, according to our site. You got the Orioles, you got the Mariners, you got the Cubs, and then it's the Mets. There's only four teams in Major League Baseball that have six players representing them in the top 100 on our site. That really shows you something when it comes to how much this farm system has really grown. Because you look at those names. Which of those guys was a top 100 guy at just baseball last year? I think, and I believe at the end of the season, it would have been Jet, Gilbert, and Acuna. And, you know, Jet Williams obviously had a great season to go there. Homegrown guy fully. Gilbert and Acuna were acquired, as was Clifford. So you have three guys that were acquired. Christian Scott and Jet Williams shot up rankings last year with a great season and continued that, or at least Scott has continued and improved on that with his great start this year. And then Sprout, a guy you drafted last year, already a top 100 prospect. It's really impressive how much better this farm system has got. And you even look further down the line when it comes to farm systems and how many have even five guys on the top 100. There's only three. You have the White Sox, Brewers, and Padres. You have eight that have four, six that have three, three that have two, and five have one. The Angels are the only team in baseball that doesn't have a top 100 prospect, according to us at Just Baseball. So really interesting stuff. And I want to go through 
the write-up that Arm had on Brandon Spro because it's new. He just got added to this list. Now, talks about him being drafted twice by the Mets. We've discussed that on this show. Drafted in the third round in 2022, second round last year. A guy that, as Arm said, had dazzling stuff that made him a first-round talent, but below average command dropped him into the second round. I've heard Arm talk about this a lot. We've talked about it. He says the command is now about average, and in Binghamton, in the last three starts where he's gone seven innings each time, he's flashing plus com- command. We don't know if that's going to hold. That is still a question, but here's his breakdown of his arsenal. He says a four-pitch mix. Spro boasts three above-average offerings with his fastball and changeup being plus, featuring a four-seamer and a two-seamer at the University of Florida. Spro has since cut down his usage on the latter in favor of a four-seam fastball with improved ride in the upper 90s. Spur has continued to gain velocity as he compiles professional starts, frequently topping triple digits. So as he has gone past start over start throughout this year, he is holding velocity deeper into games, and he is topping out even higher. He had one pitch that was one, I think it was 102.7 in his last start. It's insane. Or maybe it was 101.7. Regardless, I know it was 102 miles per hour, which is ridiculous. And here was the the biggest takeaway I had from talking with Arm about Sprout, he has compared uh, Sprout's changeup to the splinker of Paul Skeens. So a splinker, splitter sinker, is what they're calling Skeens' changeup, so to speak. A pitch that can just dive. A- and the power changeup from Sprout has the potential to be an unbelievable offering. He says Sprout has continued to prove his feel for it. It picks up disheveled swings from hitters. He pairs that with breaking balls previously favoring his mid-80s gyro slider. That's similar to Christian Scott. But after tweaking his curveball to be shorter and and sharper, he has upped the usage in 2024. Four average or better offerings, flirting with double plus, gives Sprout an arsenal that is as impressive as any arm in the Mets system. He talks about the fact that the stuff is not the issue for Sprout, but it's about, you know, you know, completing that arsenal, making sure that he really has a command of all these pitches and just cutting down on the non-competitive pitches, which has been something he has improved upon throughout this season. When it comes to the outlook, he says that, that Sprout stuff is good enough to get away with the higher walk rate, already fighting off the reliever risk. Sprout has flashed number two upside with the fallback of a volatile late rotation arm or an elite high leverage reliever. So what does that mean? Number two upside, uh, fans are always sort of confused by scouts breakdown. If Brandon Sproul's so good, why can't he be an ace? Well, the ace designation in the prospect world is really reserved for guys like Skeens. Like, no doubt top 10 prospects might get the ace label. And even then, sometimes they don't. It, it, it's a way to make sure you categorize these everyone properly. Because if you just say everyone could be an ace, if Christian Scott could be an ace, if Blade Tidwell could be an ace if Brandon Sproke can be an ace and Paul Skeens can be an ace. How do you differentiate Skeens from those other guys when Skeens is I mean, one of the best prospects that we've seen since maybe Steven Strasburg? So there has to be that way that you sort of label these guys. Like Devin Williams would have been a number three when it comes to his prospect pedigree and what he looked like early in his career. Now he's pitching like an ace for the Brewers, but – that, that's sort of what, what you have to, and did I say Freddie Peralta or Devin Williams? I swear I always mix the names up on those guys. I'm talking about Peralta. Regardless, when it comes to that little note in Sprout's scouting report of having number two upside, when he wrote Christian Scott's top 100 uh, you know, write-up before this season, Arm said that Christian Scott had number three upside. And a lot of fans were like, why did he put number three upside? This guy can be that good. It's because of that designation. A number three starter in the big leagues is a guy that's pitching to a sub three, five ERA and is great at the big league level. It's just not a top 15 pitcher in baseball, top 20 pitcher who gets that ace label. And even then it might not even be 20. It might be 15 guys. So I just want to put that out there. Now the fallback of a volatile late rotation arm. What that's saying is if the walks are out of control, This is a guy that can be one of those five starters that will strike out 12 across seven shutout, and then he'll walk seven and be knocked out of a start in four innings, that type of a deal. Hopefully, Sproat can continue to improve his command and avoid that. 
And worst case scenario, this guy will be a disgusting relief pitcher who could be a closer in the big leagues. But right now, he's looking very much like a starting pitcher and a guy that could headline a rotation with Christian Scott and Kodai Senga as soon as next year. He might even debut this year. So get really excited about Brandon Sprout. He is quickly shooting up prospect rankings. And with the fact that Scott is going to graduate this year with the innings he'll pitch in the big leagues, and the fact that Jet Williams hasn't played, we'll see, hopefully comes back soon. But I would not be surprised at all if we're talking about Brandon Sprout going into next year as the New York Mets' top prospect overall. It's been an incredible rise, and I'm looking forward to continuing to see him have success, hopefully, in double-A and maybe even push his way up to triple-A. So we'll be going through uh, that, of course, throughout this season. I want to go through some minor league news and notes, touch on all the other prospects that are in this farm system. So we'll go through that in just a minute. First, though, a word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members is the easiest and most exciting way to get on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. During the London series, maybe you just feel great about Shaman Nia's strikeouts. You take more there. Meanwhile, Lindor has been red hot. You look at his fantasy score, which is assigning a point of value to his hits, his runs, his RBIs, his home runs. He's going to have a big day. You can have a big day over at Prize Picks. You can also combine between different sports. So maybe you want to take the London series as part of your entry, but also look at the NBA Finals. You can do that with Prize Picks. Prize Picks offers quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types, which is what makes Prize Picks the number one fantasy sports app. Prize Picks also offers weekly promotions and special offers for the biggest moments in sports. Download the app today. Use the code Locked MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, download the Prize Picks app today. Use the code Locked MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with Prize Picks. The NBA Finals are underway. The Stanley Cup Finals are coming up. If you want to be up to date on all the latest in the world of sports, make sure you check out Locked On Sports today, streaming 24 7 on YouTube. Let's run through the rest of the Mets farm system here, giving you the top notes I have on some of the Mets' top prospects. Blade Tidwell did not have a great appearance. He piggybacked Christian Scott this week, had a rough outing, didn't make it out of the inning that he pitched, gave up two hits, walked two, allowed a three-run homer, four earned runs, got just two outs. It's tough. It's tough to not you know, get the, the start at the coming out of the bullpen. And just a really rough outing for him. His first two starts in AAA were great. We'll see how it continues to progress. I wouldn't get too concerned about one bad outing. Meanwhile, Dom Hamill, Mike Vassell just cannot seem to figure AAA out. Hamill has allowed seven over his last two starts. Vassell still has an ERA over six. Hasn't made it through six innings all year. Jose Buda won pitcher of the week in AAA in his first week back after being optioned. Now, in his last start, he allowed seven runs and didn't make it out of the fourth. So, rough start for him. Joey Lucchese had a good start this week. Uh, five innings pitch, one hit, hit a batter, walked two, struck out six. That was five scoreless from Lucchese. But just to show you how hard it is to pitch for the Syracuse Mets, unless your name is Christian Scott, uh, Lucchese in his first two starts back after making that spot start with the Mets against the Phillies, allowed 13 runs over his next two. So it's tough to pitch there. It really is. It's a really hard league to, to find success. Speaking of finding limited success in AAA. Luis and Helicuna has had another skid. Rough week for him over his last six games played. He's three for 24, batting 125. Ryan Clifford, starting to get it going in AA, has homered three times in his last four games, including back-to-back games Wednesday, Thursday. So far, 19 games played in AA. The stats aren't great overall. Hitting 167, 333 on base, 433 slug. But he's starting to figure it out. He's in the perfect place for the rest of this year. I don't think we see Clifford rise above double A, but he's the guy to watch out for because he could have a monster second half, particularly with the power numbers. And that was a real problem in Brooklyn was he wasn't getting the power numbers he should based on it being a really tough ballpark to hit. Now he's going to be rewarded when he strikes the ball well in Big Ten. That's great. Hopefully he can really continue to improve 
carry this hot streak and sustain it for a long period of time. Nolan McLean did not have the best start this week, gave up four and five innings pitched, but he did strike out eight and didn't walk any. So that is a positive sign. As a hitter, Nolan McLean, of course, the two-way player, 15 strikeouts in his last eight games played, and that's in 30 at bats. So not going great with the bat. Kevin Parada has struggled lately. Last 12 games played, 14 strikeouts and 40 at bats, 548 OPS. Alex Ramirez, 547 OPS. So those two guys started to disappoint again. Um, in high A, Jonah Tong finally had a bad outing. He's been remarkable all year. Only got one out, gave up five runs on four hits and two walks. So rough outing for him. Meanwhile, a guy we have not talked about getting promoted, Cade Morris. He was up at the end of May, has made three starts in high A. This is a guy that was drafted by the Mets last year. Was he a fifth round pick off the top of my head? I think that's where he was drafted. Regardless, he's been very good in high A so far. Has not allowed more than one earned run in any of his three starts. Has a 1-1-70 ERA and 15 and a third innings pitch. So Cade Morris, Jonah Tong, those are now the names to watch in the high A Brooklyn Cyclones rotation. Low A, Colin Houck starting to figure it out. Houck, of course, again, first round draft pick by the Mets last year. He's hitting 317 with a 404 on base and a 537 slug over his last 11 games played. 941 OPS, hit a home run. Starting to do some things defensively too. This is what you expected to see from Hauk. It, it wasn't always going to be a smooth transition. This is the first time he's probably ever played just baseball his entire life. And it, it's a growing period to, to go into professional baseball. Um, so we'll see if he can hold this and maybe eventually hit his way up to high A. But really good run here for Hauk, which is nice to see because his struggles were pretty great early in the season. Jesus Baez, during this same time period over the last two weeks, has struggled to a 663 OPS. Baez, shortstop prospect the Mets have had that they signed internationally. And the good thing about him is even during these struggles, he's homered three times in the last couple weeks here. He has eight home runs in 51 games played in Port St. Lucie. That's really good power numbers for a young hitter. So love what I've seen there. Boston Barrow has a 753 OPS on the season. Just another guy to watch. 19-year-old drafted in the eighth round by the Mets, and he was paid over slot to sign. So he has impressed a little bit there as well. Now, I want to talk about A.J. Ewing real quick here. Ewing was drafted last year, and he's 19, second baseman. He got promoted from the complex league to low A. He's hitting, or he was hitting 254, 422 on base, 571 slug in the complex with five home runs in 19 games. Three of those home runs took place in his last seven games played. So showcasing the power, got him up to low A. We'll see how he does. The reason why A.J. Ewing is really notable, he was the comp pick the Mets got for Jacob DeGrom signing with the Rangers. So tough act to follow for Ewing, but good to see him get that early promotion. Meanwhile, at the complex, you're still seeing Jeremy Rodriguez, who's in 325 on the year over uh, excuse me, 325 over his last nine games played as an 896 OPS on the year through 21 games. I imagine that the reason why he is staying in the complex league as opposed to getting the bump up is because you got Colin Houck playing in St. Lucie. And I think you want to keep Jeremy Rodriguez playing shortstop. This is the prospect that got back in the Tommy Pham trade. He's still only 17 years old. So there's no reason to, to rush him and move him off shortstop. It's a crowded infield that they got in St. Lucie between Barrow, Ewing now, uh, Hauk, Marco Vargas, Jesus Baez. It's tough, okay? So they got a lot of infielders. It's a real glut, which is a good thing to have that much talent, but it's also good to space these guys out. I think the reason why Ewing got the promotion was because he hit three home runs in a week and looked to be too good for that level. He needed to be challenged, and that's always the balancing act. The Mets are trying to to walk here with their top prospects. David Stearns has mentioned that. You don't want a guy at a level where they're not being challenged. Jeremy Rodriguez, at 17 years old, is still getting challenged plenty at the complex level. But will he be up by the end of this year? I think so. At some point, I imagine Colin Houck can push his way, hopefully, uh, up to high A. You could see the same thing. Maybe it's Jesus Baez that goes up, and maybe you allow both Houck and Rodriguez to play some shortstop while they get some opportunities at third base too. We'll see how they do it. Typically, though, a first-round pick 
who got first round money like how is going to get the full runway to be the starting shortstop wherever he's playing. And so for now, that has Rodriguez sort of following behind him a level below until Rodriguez's bat just gets to the point that it's undeniable. And that might happen this year. And honestly, might. Anyway, that's going to be all for our Friday Farm Report. I appreciate all of you who tuned into the show today. As I mentioned, I will give you a London series preview, probably a two segment show, depending on the news cycle. If some other stuff comes up, I might do a full three segment show. Uh, but make sure you tune into that before the one o'clock game on Saturday. Uh, and then I will do a, a show on Sunday. Maybe it'll be a, we'll, we'll see. It might be a, a Saturday stream situation. No, I'll play around with that idea just because the game on Sunday is so early. Um, it's 10 o'clock start that that podcast might go stale uh, pretty quickly. Or maybe I'll just do a recap of the whole London series after that game on Sunday morning. I'll keep you posted on that on tomorrow's show when I'm planning. Uh, make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts uh, so you stay up to date with all the latest on the audio side on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button. We're trying to make a push to 9,000 subs. I appreciate all of you who continue to subscribe. If you want to be a Locked On Mets insider, find the link in the episode description. That's subtext.com slash Locked On Mets. You can follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listener, your first watch every day. Now for your second watch, head over to YouTube and check out Locked On Sports today. Keeping you up to date on all the latest in the world of sports. Locked on Sports Today is streaming 24-7 on YouTube.